I, I want to tell you just a few dates and it really, it really stuck into my mind. So 1945, the atomic blast at Trinity. Now the UFO thing had already been going on, but that was like a real influx at that moment. I was flying over the Gulf of Mexico, sees a diamond formation on his radar of unknown objects, goes to check it out to see what's up, and he spots a spherical object. A lot of these UAPs are able to actually, um, they're, they're, they're able to identify US nuclear assets um, under the oceans. Secrets, cover-ups, and strange phenomena. UFOs and ideas that challenge reality itself. All these mysteries, all this time. Are we ever gonna get to the bottom of these? My name is George Knapp. I dig into news stories that others can't or won't. I'm Jeremy Corbell, and for some reason, people tell me things they probably shouldn't. And this is Weaponized. Weaponized. This is Weaponized. Jeremy, how you doing? Feeling strong and feeling dangerous, George. You like my look here as I'm, I'm dark like I'm in a cave? I got a surprise <laughs> yeah, for you. Right. Here it comes. Oh, he's got light. He's illuminated. You're oh. self-luminous like a UFO, George. So, so you only, you sent me this only what, a year ago? Uh, it took that me light? this long with my technical expertise, took me this long to turn on this light. So there it is. Yeah, well, you got to plug it in and then push the button. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy technology. Alien. Uh, so but, a lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff going on. We kind of stirred up our hornet's nest or helped to stir it up last week and talking uh, asking our viewers and listeners to get riled up and to call their members of Congress, and they did. Yeah, man, this it is an exciting time. People did start making calls, and I got to urge everybody, you, you still have this week, this week to influence the biggest UAP atom bomb legislation there has ever been in Senate and the House. I mean, Congress is debating this this week. This is the week to call and make those calls. We did a whole episode about it. So this one, I wanna change it around. I wanna bring people back into the past. And one of the, I, I wanna call this one War of the Worlds, man, because I have been listening 85 years ago next month. In 1938, there was this broadcast, which maybe the youngins don't know about, but it was called War of the Worlds. And it was a, a radio broadcast that falsely, people say, threw the public into panic about UFOs. But it didn't. It didn't throw the public into panic. It was Orson Welles doing like an audio play. Um, do you do you recall kind of hearing about that all along the way, George? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's one of the first things you read about in the course of investigating the history of the UFO phenomenon is, boy, the big panic that was caused. We better be careful. The, the public might freak out if we tell them the truth about UFOs and aliens and ETs, which, of course, was completely exaggerated. I've read so many articles and papers that have been written that blew it way out of proportion. People were able to figure out it's a radio show. Uh, I, mean, I guess some did not, but there was no major freak out. Uh, some people might have got misled, but no, we can handle it. Yeah, so it's like I want to kind of, you know, with the idea of War of the Worlds and the 85th anniversary coming up next month, I want to play you three clips from it for our audience, because if you haven't heard it, it's just about an hour long, but it was just so cool the way they did it back then. And it opens with Orson Welles kind of giving you this idea of what humanity is. And this was before it started sounding just like it was a radio broadcast where some people got tricked. He was laying the groundwork for what this kind of play would be online. So it's a minute and a half, but let me play this for our audience. It is so cool. So check this out. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, and they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. And with infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, spinning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design 
man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that are to our minds as ours are to the beasts in the jungle, intellects vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. Slowly and surely drew their plans against us. That's good stuff. I mean, you know, it's Mercury Theater. It's Orson Welles, actor, delivering these great lines based on H.G. Wells' book. I think most people figured out if they're a fan of that show, it's a show. But, uh, man, it's good. It's really good. Yeah, man. So so just so because, you know, I, I, if, if you don't know, you don't know. But it was just kind of this thing that was broadcast. But what happened was I think that was the intro kind of putting into the idea of, you know, drifting solar driftwood, meaning us on planet Earth. It just created this um, incredible tone of like others. There being others out there and we're about to be invaded. And again, that broadcast was 1938. So. It kind of predates everything that when we go through a little history lesson in a second from even the, the atomic era. This is before that. And they're talking about this invasion. So I want to give everybody a feel for it. If you missed that intro when you were listening in 1938, the, the, the next thing you're going to hear, it, it sounds like a broadcast, starts with a little music. And then all of a sudden, there are these explosions on Mars. So this is a, a one minute clip. But let me play this for you so you can get the experience of what it was like to be hearing this over the radio. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving toward the Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation and describes the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, unquote. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel situated in downtown New York. So I love that. So it's just all of a sudden, just, you know, you're just playing with a little bit. Hey, there are these explosions that were detected on Mars. Is that what he said? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it builds and builds and builds. And, um, you know, they end up, I won't play the, the next one. You, people can go listen to it, but it, it's just kind of neat because it, it ends up bringing people all the way through this experience where they're interrupting this normal broadcast of music. And then there's a farmer and there's farmland and something. No, let's, hear it. let's hear one more clip. Let's hear it. Okay. One more, one more clip is that they're pulling in some like fake scientists. It's like going to talk about, you know, that this is not anything to worry about. So here's the next clip. 52 seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. Due to the unusual nature of this occurrence, we have arranged an interview with a noted astronomer, Professor Pearson, who will give us his views on this event. In a few moments, we will take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, New Jersey. We return you until then to the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. So that was the, the next part, right, where they're like, oh, we're going to go to the Princeton Observatory and we're going to get, you know, an expert in here to talk about the, those explosions on Mars. But it just goes and goes, you know, they're in a field with a farmer and the farmer was like sitting there and saw this green streaking thing, just like in Las Vegas as reported, this yeah. green streaking thing. Boom, something hits the ground. Must be a meter, right? You know, and then it just gets bonkers. So that's a really neat thing if people haven't listened to that. Yeah, they can find that online. Listen to the whole thing. It's a lot of fun. And, it, you know, it became sort of a model for the narrative for a long time. The people can't handle the, the truth. The public would freak out if it comes out. There was a study, I think, 1960 by the Brookings Institute that said something similar. Boy, unless the public is acclimated to get ready for this, our social institutions would 
deteriorate and crumble if uh, it turned out that there is a more intelligent or higher civilization than us. Um, and that was that guided policy for a long time in our country. It's funny, man, even to this day, when when all of a sudden, when all of those shoot downs of like the Chinese balloon and all that were going on, I would literally get texts like, is this war of the worlds? So it's still, you know, within the zeitgeist and popular culture. And that's a big debate is like, you know, UFOs are real. Obviously, they're machines and they're they're not from here. Or if they are from here, we don't know who made them. And they've been here before we had modern technology. So the question is, is this hostile? Is this some sort of slow burn, observational overtake scientific program? And that was kind of what you heard in the intro of War of the Worlds, that we're kind of under the microscope and we've been under the microscope a long time. So it's just it's really funny that that hasn't really changed. We still don't know what the UFO phenomenon really represents. Yeah. And, you know, there's as we know from documents released after FOIA became the law of the land. There were intense internal debates between, behind the scenes within our military intelligence communities, uh, whether or not the public can handle it, what to reveal, what to know. As you and I know, we're not entirely sure that there's anybody that knows the full picture, the, the real story on this. So the debate about what or if to whether to release anything or not is kind of misguided in that sense, because it's not it's not clear anyone in inside government knows uh, the public in general, the people that we hear from all the time, they're pretty sure that they can handle it. I mean, we shot down three UFOs earlier this year. Nobody freaked out. You know, it went back to two days later, they're looking at their phones and doing Twitter and, and uh, watching for the Barbie movie and all that stuff and not worried about War of the Worlds. It was a story for a couple of days. Uh, you know, yeah, so I think... Go For ahead. our audio audience, when, when you said shot down UFOs, you used air quotes with your yeah. fingers. So yeah. our audience, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think uh, for a long time, the paternalistic folks inside a government figured they could handle the truth, whatever that truth might be. But we out here in the public, we the rubes can handle it. We'd freak out. And maybe <laughs> we would, depending on what the truth is. We don't know what it is yet. The rubes. I, I didn't know what that term meant. It was actually Joe Rogan who taught me that term. He's telling me what it meant. I didn't know that rube means like a newbie or somebody not initiated or informed or something. Yeah, anyway, unsophisticated. Though. Yes. Hey, I'm trying to get more UFO sophisticated every day. So what I'm doing is I'm reading books, George. And there was this one, this guy, Mark Mahoney from the Shamrock Social Club, the guy that does like all my tattoos, right? He he just reached over and goes, hey, Jeremy, you need to read this if you have not He handed me a book. You've told me about a whole bunch. And I, our audience should, should be able to see this. It's, it's the report on unidentified flying objects. This looks like one of the original copies. It was written by Edward J. Ruppelt. Can you tell people a little bit about what this book is? And I think it's cool. Ruppelt was uh, sort of the, one of the pioneers in the in the military study of UFOs, right from the beginning. He was head of Blue Book for a while. I think he was involved in Sign and Grudge as well. He wrote this report on unidentified flying objects after he got out of the military, and it was blockbuster stuff because, as we know, the history of, of uh, Project Blue Book, they did their best to explain away all the UFO cases they could and came up with preposterous explanations. Swamp gas is the most infamous example of that. Um, and after he got out of the program and was a private citizen, Rupelt wrote a book. I've got the copy of it. He actually wrote two versions of this. So this version was very blunt about this is a legitimate mystery. And there are cases, the more information we have about them, the less we're able to explain them away. It was a blockbuster book at the time. Then after a, a little while, Rupelt wrote another version of the book, same book, where he was much more critical of, uh, of ufologists, of some of the famous cases. Some of the stuff that he had written in the first version of the book, he even debunked his own stuff. And, you know, people have wondered what made him do an about face. Did someone come and whisper in his ear? Well, one thing that happened is he went to work for Northrop, a major defense contractor. Could his new employer have affected his view about UFOs? I don't know. Second thing is, I think I had heard uh, that his wife um, had said he moved to California and was in contact with a lot of these the UFO gurus of the time, the contactees, the giant rock folks who would gather at that place near where you live, uh, Jeremy and Pioneer Town. 
that he thought they were crazy and that he just kind of soured on the whole topic. And that's why he changed his opinion. He's uh, dead and gone for a long time, so that he's not around to ask him anymore. But people should definitely check out that book. It, it is a classic in the field. Yeah, I'm I'm loving it. So I, again, that's I, I highly recommended. You know, I've tried to educate myself on what happens in the past. So I've really gotten a history lesson, man. From this book, there's this timeline that I'm starting to see really clearly. I mean, again, you forget stuff and you remember it when it becomes more important. But in the spirit of War of the Worlds, with this increased frequency, these swarms of UFOs around our naval warships, around our destroyers, around our aircraft carriers. I mean, man, George, we are getting so many direct. Uh, reports from people on these ships that are seeing these swarms that, that, and we're talking so many now, you give me a year in the last five, uh, eight years and bam, it's happening. But reading this book, I realized we're, we're right where we were all the way back when this book was written. This book was actually written in 1952 uh, originally. However, uh, I'm sorry, this book was written in... It was uh, 1956. Yeah. However, he's talking about cases and things that were happening before that. And we're talking about the atomic era where there are these kind of visual swarms the army's seeing. So I, I want to tell you just a few dates. And it really, it really stuck into my mind. So 1945, the atomic blast at Trinity. Now, the UFO thing had already been going on. But that was like a real influx at that moment. Then, of course, we know 1947, that's the, the Kenneth Arnold sighting, which really put the word flying saucer on the map. Although the reporters misunderstood, he said they weren't shaped like saucers, but the way they moved was like skipping a saucer on water. So they, the, the media said flying saucer. So all of a sudden that word became like what we know as flying saucers. But then, I mean, Rupelt, he says he claims he coined the term UFO because it was better, unidentified flying object. But but also in 1947, right after the Kenneth Arnold famous UFO sighting of multiple ship at Mount Rainier, you have that famous twining memo, which is, uh, you know, the Air Force uh, Material Command, or sorry, the Air Material Command uh, to Army Air Force, uh, I, I believe that was based out of Wright Patterson Air Force Base. You've got you got Nathan Twining, and he's saying, as you've talked about, UFOs are not imaginary or fictitious. It, it's a real phenomenon. It's tangible. It's real. You've talked about that a lot, but that memo, we should show that, put that up on the screen to people, at least a part of it. I mean, that was like 1947 as a history lesson. It's like all of a sudden, you got some serious action here. So boom, from what I understand. 1948, Project Sign begins. 1949, they call it Project Grudge. And, and in this book, he's talking about the transition of name was symbolic. Yeah. Project Grudge, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, the Twining Memo 47, you and I talked about it and, and shared that information with Joe Rogan when we were on his podcast recently. That memo is critical. I mean, it's it's indicative of the paper trail that existed prior to FOIA becoming the law of the land. And we've talked about it a couple of times before. Before FOIA existed, they could converse in memo form and reports back and forth, different military agencies and intelligence entities about UFOs with no fear that the public would ever see this, this paper trail. So they were candid about it. Now they're a lot more canny. They, they figured out other ways to hide things. But back then, they were forthright in saying, this is real. It's not imaginary or fictitious. It's real. We don't think it's ours. Project Sign, that report that came out, the first big study, concluded, we think these are probably interplanetary, extraterrestrials. I don't think they use the term ET, but interplanetary vehicles. And the, the report got to the desk of Hoyt Vandenberg, chief of the Air Force, and he said, no, I'm not signing that. General Twining, by the way, later became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's no flunky. He's no fluke. He was a brilliant guy, who rose to the top of his profession, he thought it was real. Uh, so when they when Hoyt Vandenberg killed Project uh, Sign, it became Project Grudge. And I think you're right, that name is sort of indicative of the attitude they had. After that, that was the last honest UFO study. They just, they debunked everything. Yeah, it's incredible. I'm, I'm looking through the memo now and it's kind of talking about the, the characteristics that come with UFOs, you know, circular or, or elliptical in shape, 
you know, flat on the bottom, domed on top. I mean, they, I was told that Project Sign was originally called Project Saucer, really, and then it, you know, it was called Project Sign. And 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 just let me read that one part to make sure I I we are real exact. It is the opinion that the phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. You know, it goes on and on, but that was a real kind of key moment. Um, from there, though, we do know that from Project Sign, it turned to Project Grudge. And that was 1948, Project Sign, 1949, Project Grudge. But then 1952, Project Blue Book. And that lasted all the way till 1969 in the form we knew it. And that was effectively a disinformation campaign. And everybody basically admits that, that the public facing version Although they were trying to be dismissive and say it was swamp gas and whatever they wanted to say, internally, the scientists, the people within the military, not only were they seeing them, as you often say, UFOs are in movies because you actually see them in person. That's why people are putting them in movies. But the scientific community, they were really somber and honest and true about it. It was only a forward projection to really try to dismiss it. And then a lot of that 1952 Project Blue Book, you know, gets initiated um, and then, as if a cosmic joke, in, in 1952, in July, in D.C., there were the UFO flyovers two weekends in a row, as, as you've talked about. And what, what I found was really funny, which is that, um, from what I understand at that time, that, that Rupert happened to be in D.C. when that was going on. Oh, yeah. It was, he didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, you know, there were a bunch of the top brass were in D.C. In uh, I'll tell you what, in um, Richard Dolan has a really great book, UFOs in the National Security State. He says that Rupelt had a warning that it was going to happen, that there was going to be an overflight, something really dramatic over either New York or Washington. And it turned out to be Washington. And the the our Air Force brass was there prepared to issue a statement saying, we've explained all this stuff away. There's nothing to it. Move on here, folks. Nothing to see. And these things fly right over them. They they tried to explain the first one away as temperature inversions. I mean, people on the ground saw them. The jets were scrambled. They chased them. They were on radar, on both ground-based, on air-based radar. And they tried to explain it as temperature inversion. And just after they finished debunking it one weekend, it came back as if to rub it in their face. It was hilarious. Well, you know, uh, big shout out to Richard Dolan. People always ask online, are you friends with him? Yeah, we're friends with him. We love the guy's work. We should have my weaponized sometime. I'm glad you brought up his book. He's done a lot of this historic kind of digging. So I'm glad you talked about that. So what I've understood from reading the book and also kind of going deeper into our history, War of the Worlds, baby, um, what I found out was that President Harry Truman, um, that he had his Air Force aide call uh, Rupelt and ask for an explanation of the sightings and the radar and the unknown radar returns. Um, so there was interest all the way up to the president in 1952 when th this is the closest thing to like landing on the White House lawn that ever happened. And it's just so funny that it happened the year Project Blue Book was initiated. Now on that in that time period, just a number of days after that second wave, because every newspaper in the world was reporting on, especially out of D.C., um, Major General John Samford, I think was his name, and the Air Force Director of Intelligence, Roger Ramsey, they Ramey. held... Ramey. Ramey, sorry, Roger Ramey? From Roswell. <laughs> they held a press conference at the Pentagon. And, and essentially the message was nothing to see here, move on, because UFOs do not pose a national security threat, which, you know, which was kind of the statement that, that uh, General Samford, Major General Samford kind of made, which is so funny because it's different now. Now the, the message is, well, this is a national security threat because things are in our airspace flying with impunity. So that's a pretty amazing change of public stance, right? I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. 
In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and two thousand reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberrations. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. Our basic difficulty in dealing with these is that there is no measurement of them that makes it possible for us to put them in any pattern that would be profitable for a deliberate a uh, custom sort of analysis to take the next step. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage, and that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. Yeah, I, I'd say so. A lot of the things are exactly the same. I would say this, if we're doing like a book report, if you don't mind, Jeremy, I'd like to share something. If people, I mean, you could learn so much by studying the history of this and the battles that have already been fought. So if our listeners and viewers really want to take a deep dive, I'll give two other examples. Is that okay? Yeah, please. This is a book group. Let's do it. It's a book club. It's a right. book club. This is one, The UFO Controversy in America. It's by David Michael Jacobs. David Jacobs is better known now as a guy who writes about alien abductions and the alien agenda, very controversial stuff. He, he got into a meeting with abductees, and that became the focus of his research. But back when he was a Ph.D. candidate as a student, he wrote this as his, as his uh, thesis, and it became one of the very best UFO books ever. It explains all the politics, the behind-the-scenes maneuvering that was going on between Project Sign and Grudge and Blue Book and what came after. It's a terrific book if you want to know about the early days of the UFO movement in our country and about the end of Project Blue Book, the sneaky tricks that were taken on this Condon committee to, to try to discourage uh, the public from being interested in it, discourage the scientific community, that the effect of the Condon committee, which was rigged from the beginning, um, has lasted with us ever since. And then there's this one. This is by Lawrence Fawcett and Barry Greenwood. The later editions are called the UFO cover-up. It was originally called something else, Clear Intent. It was the first UFO book I read back when I started down this road. It is the absolute best uh, look at the paper trail of government documents. It's based entirely on government documents released through FOIA. And a lot of them released because of the work of Greenwood and Fawcett and their colleagues. And if you want to see how the cover-up began and how it has been perpetuated, that's a book to read. I, I love it that I had to like uh, very uh, theatrically get the book from my bed stand and bring it down by the computer because I got one good UFO book I really want people to read because it's teaching me a lot. And George is literally sitting there unscripted and he can just reach his hand out and grab any book he wants about UFOs in your house. <laughs> I've got more. We talk about War of the Worlds. This is the Mars attacks. There's a whole series of, of uh, playing cards, trading cards. I didn't know these existed, but I could not live without them once I found out they were real. Uh, you can see the, the artwork is what inspired Tim Burton in his uh, Mars Attacks movies. I don't know. I'm Mars. not doing a very good job with this. but Oh, we're, I'm going to get a photo of that and put that big on the screen. Don't All you right. worry. Okay. All right. Anyway. Yeah, man, look. I no, I, I pre look, man, this is like so weaponized is like you and me having our weekly talks about UFOs, and it's so cool to allow that to be public. 
um, when we're, we're share, we got to look back at the past. That's why I pulled up all of that War of the World stuff. I'm going deep into the past trying to say, hey, wh- how are we looking at this now? How have we gotten to the point where this is a national security threat? There's legislation. When back in the day, it was all about dismissal, not national security threat. We'll end up playing a clip from uh, Major General John Samford, and you can see how, what the tone was. Man, people have to understand how far we have gotten with with transparency on this. But we're young with this. We got to keep fighting. But man, I was just really appreciating everything that happened before to really put into light where we are today. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think back then, as now, you got people within the military at the upper echelons who wanted to go away. They don't want it to be their job to study UFOs. They gather this information in the course of their duties because they got planes and radar and other sensor systems, but they don't want to be in charge of that study. And probably they shouldn't be. But that just so happens they have the best evidence in their hands. And if there is some way it could get into the hands of civilian researchers who get a clearance or something, maybe that's the way to move forward. But I can tell you, we know it for a fact that the people at the highest levels want this to go away. They are opposed to transparency. They are exerting their influence in Congress right now. The congressman from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is in an incredibly influential position as chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. He said, no more UFO hearings, make this go away. And his opposition has had a major effect on the legislation that's pending. So, so talking about the past, let's move into current events, uh, and I think we should we should talk about what's happened this week. And uh, you and I, we have a friend. His name is Christopher Sharp, Chris Sharp, and he runs a publication called Liberation Times. And man, it, I mean, it's funny. You'll tweet me, or t- you'll text me because I don't directly read tweets, but you'll you'll text me a new article he's done. And man, that that Chris Sharp is sharp. And I'd love to, to pull him in and, and hear what he has to say about the, the, the this last week and what's been going on in the world of UFOs. Yeah, he is, as usual, he's out on the cutting edge of this topic. And uh, Chris of uh, Liberation Times, welcome back to Weaponized. Thank you so much for having me back on, Jeremy and George. It's a pleasure to be on with two live legends such as yourself. So yeah, thank you. Let's jump into this latest story that you wrote. It's getting traction all over the world. How did you come across it? Tell us what's in it. Uh, yeah, so it, it's based around the um, uh, UAP that was spotted um, on the Gulf of Mexico um, by pi- a test pilot from the U.S. Air Force operating out of Egling Air Force Base in Florida. Um, <clears throat> so it was an incident that was brought up in the UAP hearing in a house in July by Representative Matt Gates, representative within Florida, who was alerted to the incident. But I think it, it was the pilot himself that alerted um, Representative Gates to it. And that was something really, really stuck to my mind because um, obviously there, there, there was a really big argument actually at the base between Representatives Gates, um, Luna, another Florida representative um, who participated in the hearing in July, and uh, represented Burchett. Um, and it turned out that only Representative Gates, being a member of the Armed Services Committee, could actually get access to a, a um, confidential briefing on that case. And it stood out to me because it's a case involving the US Air Force, and it's on the record as well, you know, um, at that UAP hearing. And we know historically the US Air Force has not engaged in UAP topic and they've not been transparent. And from my what my sources have told me, that they were not prepared to engage with the UAP task force. They were at first, by the way, they were at first actually going to actually, um, you know, um, they, they were prepared to actually talk to the UAP task force about UAP incidents, but then they did a total turnaround and they just went silent. So, um it's kind of been a mystery in terms of the US Air Force. You know, we know that the Navy's been kind of like more transparent on this. And um, yeah, I just thought that was a really, really interesting case to follow up on. Um, so I basically wanted confirmation that something actually did occur over the Gulf of Mexico involving a pilot operating out of Egan Air Force Base. And secondly, I wanted confirmation that if that event did happen, what's happened to it? Did the US Air Force report it? If so, is that being investigated? So I managed to get acknowledgement that Representative Gates did actually receive a private briefing 
on this um, incident um, involving a UAP over the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and secondly, I got confirmation from, this is all from the DOD, by the way, um, I got confirmation as well that um, the Arrow, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, um, the Pentagon's um, UFO office, had received a report of a UFO incident by Eglin Air Force Base. It literally, we've got confirmation that the US Air Force has reported a UFO incident to the Pentagon's uh, UFO office. And, and I think that's quite big, you know. I think that's a really, really important milestone now. Can you uh, just break it down for people that don't know and don't know what you're talking about? I know on Liberation Times, you have an article about this, but what happened? What are the facts? What happened in this UFO case? So from Representative Gates' account, what occurred was that a uh, test pilot operating from Eglin Air Force Base um, was flying over the Gulf of Mexico, sees a diamond formation on his radar of unknown objects, goes to check it out to see what's up, and he spots a spherical object um, over the ocean, um, well, over, over the water. And um, some accounts, some sources have told me that it appeared that this object was docked with something underneath the water, um, you know, resembling the Tic Tac case of 2004. So... Um, if that is correct, uh, I think that's very, very interesting. So we know that right now the Arrow is actually analyzing that case, working from the data it, it has. And that's really crucial, by the way, like what data is being made available to the Arrow. Um, so, yeah, and it's prioritizing that. And the DOD confirmed that it would look to um, release a report into that case on its, uh, on its website. And one other big thing I must report in terms of that case, in terms of what came out from Representative Gates, was that when the pilot approached this object, the um, his ra his or her radar went down, and also the um, the infrared camera went down as well. So the FLIR system went down as well. So he had to manually take um, uh, a photograph of um, of this object. So, uh, I mean, you know, if you know your history, that premise of other cases where by sensor systems have suddenly malfunctioned or gone down when they're approaching a mysterious object. Yeah, that's like Commander Chad Underwood had active jamming, so he had to go into manual mode and switch through all the options to get as much visual evidence back that he could to the intelligence group. It is something you see all the time, and that's different than passive jamming, which is like interference. This is active jamming, which shows an intelligence, a directed intelligence, and it shows a technology that is actually quite uh, disturbing to our national security. Here's what I'm curious about, the sequence of events. Back in July, Jeremy and I are in D.C. meeting with uh, Congressman Ga uh, Gates and Tim Burchett and Representative Luna, and they had told the committee at that open hearing about this trip they took to Eglin. They thought they were going down there to get a briefing on UAP. Air Force said, no, 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 we're not here to talk about that. They pitched a little fit, and then Gates gets to see something remarkable that he couldn't talk about. I am curious whether... Arrow gets a report from the Air Force after that happens. If uh, if all this happened after the members of Congress raised a stink about it, or had the Air Force already made a report to Arrow? Do you know? Do we know? Well, this, well, this is why I went out of the case because we we did we definitely know that something happened. You know, if if I had received a response from the DoD saying that nothing's been reported from Eglin Air Force Base. I think that would have been even more of a story, you know, that would have been, that would have applied even more pressure onto the Air Force. Um, so I don't know. We, we can speculate this, but I, I would speculate that if the US Air Force had not have reported this incident, then there would have been reasonable causes to actually apply pressure onto, um, you know, its leaders in terms of actually cooperating with Congress. It would have put it in major problems. So, um, I, I think it was left in a situation that it couldn't, it, it, it couldn't not actually, you know, it, it, it couldn't just stand still. The US Air Force couldn't. They had to cooperate. They had to engage. They had to send this report. Otherwise, you know, obviously a lot of, um, a lot of suspicions would be raised. So I, I don't yeah. think it was left with an opportunity not to report this case. They had to report it because they got busted by these members of Congress who called them out. Yeah. Correct. Correct.
<laughs> so yeah, it's a really, really interesting case. So, you know, they are prioritizing this case, the arrow is. So hopefully we'll hear more about it soon. And um, I'd be really interested to see what the analysis shows. I did speak to NORAD about it. NORAD stated to me that they've got no reports of unknown tracks, as they call them, um, uh, over the Gulf of Mexico or, or by Eglin Air Force Base earlier this year. Um, however, uh, one thing to take into account is that once an object goes over a military range, it then becomes the responsibility of that military range to kind of like take action or not take action. So it's kind of like a passing of the baton that happens um, when NORAD is tracking an object that goes to that um, kind of area. They'll still cooperate with that military range, you know, and whoever controls that. But um, ultimately, it's up to that <laughs> military range to kind of like take the decision. Do we allow an unknown object to kind of like um, hover over our skies and over our territory within our restricted ranges? <laughs> Or do we not? And, and it just seems really, really funny to me that, you know, for years now, it seems as though that, um, you know, that the Air Force, the Army, the Marines, the Navy have just been happy to allow these unknown objects to hover over their, um, their ranges and not take action. Look, we don't know, you know, UAP, you know, the U means unidentified. So we don't know whether these are Chinese, Russian, or something of unknown origin, which could be non-prosaic. I, I think it's really, really important to categorize these, you know. If I'm, if I, if I'm a, um, you know, a Chinese spy operative, you know, I'm thinking, excellent. I'm going to go here because I know that they're not going to take action, you know, and, and that might, might, that might be for a good reason, you know, because the U.S. Air Force may not want to take, they don't want to take the risk perhaps to go after some of these objects because, doing so, uh, may affect morale, let's say, because, you know, if the if the world's biggest superpower, which you guys are in the US, you know, don't have control of your own skies, don't have dominance over your own skies, it's a pretty um, sobering, sobering kind of like thing to um, to contemplate, isn't it? Really, and I think it would affect morale of um, you know pilots and whatnot if that was widely known. And yeah, so it, it's a big thing to deal with. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a good segue into another topic I wanted to talk with you about. Look, your reporting is fantastic. I recommend everybody goes to Liberation Times, reads through your previous articles and the new one. Uh, but in current events, in the spirit of current events, you know, something happened this week, which was pretty interesting. It, Customs and Border Patrol released UAP footage. I mean, kind of seemingly out of the blue. So for people that don't know, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, uh, it's, it's a federal agency to protect our borders. And, you know, real quietly, uh, there was these 10, actually 12 UAP videos that were, that were just dropped, uh, accompanied with a 389 page, uh, report that was partially redacted and written a little while ago. But it was just a really interesting drop from a federal agency. There was some pretty good reporting on it. I know Gaudi at NBC had Christopher Mellon on and they talked about it. You can go watch that video. We can, play some of it in here, but everybody should check that out. But I, I'm just curious, you guys, that was a, oh, and also um, Matthew, a senior science reporter from Daily Mail, did an excellent article on this drop. But I was just wondering what you guys thought about this. You know, here we have a federal agency. Obviously, there's people on the inside that are like, let's get some of these videos out. I mean, some of them already were out, like the Aguadilla, Puerto Rico video. Look, the quality of the video, this or that, that's not what I'm asking. What do you think about a federal agency just dropping all this info and walking? Well, you got to figure, as you said, there are people in those agencies, agencies other than Arrow and other than the U.S. Air Force, who probably would like some answers. And they'd like this to be discussed out in the open. And they're willing to take a chance and release stuff and hope that the, that, uh, the gods of retribution don't come down on them too hard. Um, but that, that's an amazing release. I, I'm, I'm encouraged by it. I hope that other agencies that have sensor abilities and cameras and planes and things of that sort who might be able to collect this stuff will, will follow that example. It's interesting how some of it had been leaked prior to journalists and the public. And now we're seeing it kind of, um, you know, the retroactive, like, here we go. We're going to put this out now. 
I, I am encouraged by it. I think it's great. I think context is is king right now because there's a lot of confusion in UFO land. So I think it, it would be nice if there was some context. But look, I'm not going to say it's a bad thing. Stuff was released. It, it was great. And I hope there are more official releases, but I certainly know there's going to be more unofficial releases. But what did you oh, think, We're Chris? all about transparency. That's the word, right? That's what Arrow says. That's what everybody talks about. The Pentagon, Susan Goff. Um we're all about transparency. So I would think they're encouraged by this coming forward and they want more of it. <laughs> is that sarcasm, George? Yes. Yes, that is. Okay, but just making sure our listeners understand. But Chris, what did you think seeing that kind of just drop of a bunch of videos from um, one of our agencies? Yeah, so I'd spoken to someone previously um, who worked within one of those agencies and within that agency, sorry. And, um, I mean, he was just explaining to me is that a lot of agents are kind of like patrolling and stuff, border and other areas within the U.S. And they see lots of weird things in the sky a lot of the time. And um, these things just aren't being documented, basically. Um, and, um, I mean, there is concern that there could be um, potential spying from other nations. It could be something to do with drug smuggling, perhaps. But simply because these things are just seen as too strange, they're just not being looked at and they're not being um, they're not being analyzed like they should in terms of um, these events to see what kind of like risk um, they do pose. So um, I think, you know, this individual I spoke with, you know, was calling on leaders um, within the agency to kind of take action and kind of like look into this more. Um, I don't think it was being taken very, very seriously at the time. Um, but I, I think now it may be looked at differently with the increased scrutiny in terms of UAP across various agencies and offices within the US government. So I think this is definitely a good sign that perhaps these are being taken a little bit more seriously. Um, what I would also say as well is that, you know, if, if, if agencies are coming under increased scrutiny in terms of UAPs being documented, also, you know, if I'm in charge of an agency, I'm going to be calling for more funding as, as well. If they're going to ask me to kind of, um, you know, uh, look into UAPs and document cases and stuff, you're going to need extra resources to do that. So there's an element of that perhaps involved as well. So um, it'll be interesting, though. It'll be very, very interesting. Again, it's just kind of like this fundamental thing. You know, do you, you know, do, does the, the world's biggest superpower know what's occurring in its own skies it's um it's a pretty big question another big thing that kind of occurred this week uh, last week's episode of weaponized george and i kind of ended on this point of hey there's there's a call to action and you know i might not be a political advocate but i know i can pick up a phone and call somebody so a lot has happened this week it was really exciting there were, uh, were there's already these advocacy groups that i mentioned on the last weaponized, but everybody started making calls and, and saying, I've talked to this person, I've talked to that person. You know, I'm really happy to report that, you know, with the people that I have within all of these different areas, we are, and I quote, moving the needle. This week was huge. People's voices were heard. So what we're talking about is the new UAP legislation. This is something that we covered on the last show. We covered when we were on the Joe Rogan podcast. We even covered this a, a long time right when it first came out. But the whole point of it is that this is a huge opportunity that we have for transparency, unlike anything we've had before. This is our legislative representatives really fighting to try to uncover what's been going on with the reverse engineering and exploitation and even the bodies, the biologicals of what they call non-human intelligence. So to remind everybody, there's this bill that's being conferenced right now and it's being conferenced within the House. Senate has already agreed. And basically last week we we're like, hey, everybody call up, use these advocacy websites, make some noise because this is a chance for us to move the needle. Well, it did. We have been heard, but be relentless. We still have time. Maybe this whole next week, we have time to like make noise and let people know that we care about the UFO um, uh, bill, that we care that it's put into the National Defense Authorization Act, the Intelligence Authorization Act, that we can get to brass tacks on what's been going on with private industry as well, sequestering this technology maybe for personal profit rather than for the good of humankind. So that's really what's at stake. With that premise said, I just wanted everybody to know directly that you've had impact, 
Don't stop. You got one week, this week left to make your voice heard. And all of that is online. Like how you just make a phone call with that said, Chris, what have you heard about the legislation? What have you heard about, you know, word on the wash, everybody talking about it. Have people been making noise, Chris? Yes. Yes. It's it's certainly made an impact. And, you know, I want to, I want to thank, you know, people like yourself, um, Ronak, Lester, Sean. I mean, there are so many names that I've probably forgotten as well. There's so many good people within the community that have done great work and worked very, very hard in actually ensuring that action can be taken. And they provided some excellent platforms to do so as well. So thank you everyone for being involved in this and kind of like really pushing this forward. Um, yeah. So it has, it has made a difference. Look, th- this is conference that we're getting into now. So it's kind of like a negotiation. So as we know, the Senate has UAP language very big UAP language within its version of the Intelligence Authorization Act, which is going to be swallowed up by the National Defense Authorization Act. So they'll put two and two together, basically. Um, however, we know that the House had zero UAP language in its version of the Intelligence Authorization Act. So you, <laughs> it's kind of like you, you've got like a really strange scenario here where it seems that the House doesn't want anything in terms of the House Intelligence um, Committee and the Senate intelligence committee is just on a totally different path when it comes to this it wants to really escalate things you know um so what we're looking to do is we're looking to get as much of that language passed as possible and look it is a negotiation there's lots of competing interests in here i think as you know you two certainly know there's certainly a revolving door in terms of um, government and contractors you know you've only got to look at the um the Secretary of Defense, you know, former Raytheon, you know, to, to see that this, this is kind of like a big deal because a lot of these government officials um, certainly have worked for contractors as well. Um, and I think also you can look at it in terms of um, representatives as well. You, you look at a lot of representatives in Congress, a lot of them have um, been financed, let's say, by the likes of Lockheed Martin, um, uh, and Norfolk Grumman and whatnot. So there are, there are major interests to play in. Look, if the um, contractors do want to have their voices heard, they can certainly call up a few favors, let's say. So I, I think there's a lot going on here. I mean, obviously, as you would have seen, there's a lot, um, around this language of eminent domain at the moment in terms of the US government being able to take kind of like possession of, of some of these craft and beings of unknown or non-human origin. Um, so I think that's, Pretty thrown, I, I think that's thrown up a hurdle. I, I think when the initial language came through within the Intelligence Authorization Act, basically providing amnesty for a lot of these um, contractors, let's say, um, that was something that they really liked because it provided them a way out. It provided them a way out in terms of this because there are lots of legalities involved here. Um, however, I think when the Schumer Amendment came up, it was like, Okay, you're going to get amnesty, but also we're going to get to uh, take possession of some of these crafts as well. I think that's probably, I, I think that's probably thrown up a problem. But look, there's a lot of competing interests at play here. I mean, <clears throat> in terms of Congress, they want democratic oversight. You know, this is how government, in terms of the US, is supposed to function: democratic oversight. If you don't have oversight, you don't have a democracy. So this is really, really fundamental and big in terms of your nation and how it operates, you know. So that's in terms of Congress. So that's kind of part of its agenda. In terms of, you know, the White House, let's say, um, uh, getting get, getting getting hold of these programs, I mean, it'll be a really, really big win in terms of, like, you'll get to have, like, another kind of, like, um, Apollo mission, you know, you know, when Apollo took off and um, you had, like, a decade of, progression in terms of getting to the moon and all these other technologies came out of it you know through this big effort um same with the manhattan project as well so i i think they see a potential in terms of this in terms of getting lots of technology out and basically cementing the u.s as the dominant global superpower in terms of technology and science so that's kind of what's at play for the white house here but in terms of the the contractors i <laughs> And also, I guess this verges on kind of like the U.S. government's agenda as well, is that there may be competing programs from other nations. So you might have a Chinese UAP program, you might have a Russian UAP program, and other nations involved. And they might be making a lot of progress because a lot of these other nations 
um, let's just say they're, they're, they're very much authoritarian and they can keep a secret better than the US in many instances and they can have a bigger effort in terms of this, um, whereby a lot of the contractors, from my understanding in the US, Look, they can have all, Lock, Lockheed Martin, for instance, could throw billions at it. It can throw all the money they can at this, you know, but unless they can get the human resources, the human resources onto these programs, they can't make very much progress. So it's in the interests of Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, BAE systems, whoever else may possess these programs to actually bring out these programs into the public and make a deal whereby they can get more staff, you know, working on this. They want the best engineers on this. They want the best scientists on this. Currently, that's restricted. If you've ever smoked uh, a marijuana joint in your life, basically, like when you were 17 years old, you know, and you're uh, the best engineer in the country now, you're, there ain't a chance you're getting uh, onto this program because of that, you know. So it's so restrictive um, that it kind of like, it, it's counter it's counterproductive, basically. So, you're talking about a workforce that's aging in terms of a lot of these, um, a lot of these pro. Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, hold on. You got to You got to introduce sorry. him. I'm fine. It happened. <laughs> so He's this is um, Lincoln. Oh yes. <laughs> so this is Lincoln. Lincoln's um, adorable. <laughs> so you're talking about uh, um, an in, an instance whereby um, they're not getting the proper staff in, involved with these programs. And, um, I mean, I mean, that's, that's a really, really big deal because China and other countries may be making a lot of progress on some of these, um, programs whereby the U.S. isn't because it's handicapping itself from the lack of, um, the, the lack of access from the best in the world, basically, in terms of engineers and scientists. And that's also where it verges into government interest as well. Because if you do have a UAP program in China, for instance, that is making more progress because they are, a, they are actually able to get the best engineers and scientists in this, that's a major threat for the US. You know, look, it's come to my attention that a lot of these UAPs are able to actually, um, they're, they're, a, they're able to identify US nuclear assets um, under the oceans. And, um, you know... Let's say that China manages that capability, then all of a sudden you're talking about the US um, nuclear deterrent kind of like being uh, neutralized to some extent. So uh, there's so much at play here in terms of, you know, the executive branch, you know, the Congress and contractors. And I just wonder, you know, are they talking to each other? Do we need to get them in a room together, you know, in terms of representatives from the contractors, from the White House, National Security Council? And, um, you know, the gang, the, the gang of eight, do we need to get them in the room together just to say, look, these are, <laughs> this is what we're going to do because everything's at stake. And just one more thing to add, sorry, as well, because this is so important here. Um, look at, look at the wider context here. So next, next, next year, for instance, in your country, you know, you could see potentially another Trump, you know, um, presidency. And what happens if that happens, you know, like uh, from my understanding, Trump has been briefed on the UAP issue. He is aware that some of these programs may exist as well. Um, John Radcliffe has basically said that we're trying to get UAP information out before um, Trump's presidency ended. And look, we, we, you know, whether, whether you like Trump or not, we can all agree that he's a very, very different politician and um, he will blow caution to the wind if needed. So uh, I think everyone needs to think about this. If we can get this National Defense Authorization Act passed and get confirmation that there is a UAP program, I think that works in everyone's interest if we can get it done next year. If it comes to a Trump presidency, who knows what happens? You know, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of risk that comes into it now if Trump's president. So I think people really do need to take that into account as well. Um, so yeah, sorry, I, I went on a tangent there, but th those are my thoughts when it comes to this. Hey, can I ask something that's out of the blue? If we, uh, if we have to edit this out because it's out of left field, um, so be it. But I want to ask you, Chris, if you've, t and Jeremy, you can jump in this too, but about Peru. So we got these reports, uh, several weeks ago about some strange things that Peruvian natives were seeing, uh, objects in the sky, supposedly shooting rays, and there were injuries caused. And then a week or two later, we hear this explanation that it's really illegal miners in Peru 
and they've been using jetpacks to fly around. I don't know what's crazier, aliens or illegal miners with jetpacks. Chris, have you done any inquiries about that to try to get a handle on it? We don't really have any sources that can that, that can fill us in, but I'm just curious whether you know anything. Yeah, I, I need to look into that more. What, one thing I'd caution about South America is it's, it, it's a very, very superstitious place. Um, and, and also, like, there's, there's financial incentives at play as well with this. You know, like, you're looking for, let's say you're looking for a, Virgi a Virginia um, video showing a being, for instance, you know. Um, and now all of a sudden, because you're looking for that video and you're willing to pay a reward for that video, all of a sudden, you know, you've got all these gangs and stuff making videos saying, here it is. Where's my reward? You know, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of things you have to take into account, um, with this. And it's just a different culture for me, but something I'm, I'm familiar with and it's difficult to navigate, um, around these kind of cases. Um, especially when you're talking about remote places as well. I think what you really do need is you need a seasoned investigator on the ground um, with some sensor systems um, uh, to see what's actually really going on there. I don't know if it's something that's still taking place or not, but if it is, you can get some really good data perhaps in terms of uncovering what this is. Right. Yeah. I mean, George and I've run into this a lot. It's a quagmire. You can't do everything on your own. You, you have to rely on people on the ground, people that you trust. And look, it's, it's a big world. And as we know, UFO activity is ubiquitous across the globe. It's everywhere all the time throughout history. So yeah, we run into that problem. Well, listen, I, I, I do want to go over with George. I want to go over some things with you about uh, one thing that people have been taking issue with publicly, which is the imminent or eminent domain aspect of the legislation. But I think you and I can do that now. But Chris, I just wanted to thank you so much for your time. And uh, for people that were just listening on audio, what happened was one of your adorable children, Lincoln, walked in the room and you know, kind of made a cameo, which he does sometimes. I haven't seen it on the news yet, but I've seen it on podcasts. So anyway, hope you're doing good, Chris. Thank you so much for the journalism that you do and the good work you do. And thanks for joining us late night for you on this new weapon. And, and I'm going to look out for your work. Liberation Thank Times, you, folks. Sir. Check it out. Thanks, Chris. Thank you Thanks, so sir. much, Bo. If I need to set a new bedtime for my son, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I, I always learn so much from Chris. He, he's a great reporter out of the UK, but he's got his finger on the pulse, not only with you know our systems of government, what's going on with UAP, but just around the world and also on social media. So something that I've been seeing that Chris kind of touched upon there is this section in the legislation, George, and it's this section that you and I kind of highlighted on the Rogan podcast, and I even said in that podcast, I don't know about that part. It's the eminent domain part. And it's very short in this UFO or UAP legislation, but I want to read it to you. I have some thoughts, but I'd love to hear what you think. So in the bill, there's this section that they're also additionally trying to pass, which is section 910, and it's disclosure of recovered technologies of unknown origin and biological evidence of non-human intelligence and its exercise of eminent domain. The federal government shall exercise eminent domain over and, and all recovered technologies of unknown origin and biological evidence of non-human intelligence that may be controlled by private persons or entities in the interests of public good. And I'm just curious because a lot of people are like, wait a second, does that mean the government could come and just like swoop in on Lockheed and take all the hardware back that maybe they gave them in the first place? What does it mean for people that have materials that they might have picked up from crash retrieval sites? What, do you have any idea of why that's in there or what you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it is to give our government legal authority to go out and grab the goodies. That's what it's meant to do. Now, eminent domain in our country, I've done a lot of stories about it. Local governments use it, state governments use it. They use it if they have to, to get property to build like a road or a school, supposedly something in the public good. Uh, that's when you use it. Uh, Americans don't like uh, government to use eminent domain in general because often it has been misused. Um, you know, insiders have used it to, to make a lot of money. The governments sometimes don't fairly compensate uh, the people whose property they take under the guise of eminent domain. In this case, I think the intention is, we know you've got this stuff and we're coming after it. You can either give it up or we're gonna come and get it. Uh, my question would be, does that apply to somebody like, say, 
I don't know, Bob Lazar? Let's say he had a couple of pieces of something that doesn't exist, some unobtainium. I don't know. Give it a number if you want. Uh, is he required to give it up? Uh, and does he face criminal penalties if he doesn't? What about Jacques Vallée, Dr. Gary Nolan, who've been doing some analysis on some strange materials that they've picked up allegedly at crash sites? Uh, do they have to turn that over or face criminal penalties? I, I think that the intent of the legislation is to go after the stuff in the hands of the big aerospace companies. But it is so broadly worded, it sure sounds like it applies to private persons, private citizens like Valet, like Nolan, like Lazar. And, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that people are going to want to comply with that. Right. And, and so as this legislation is kind of being, uh, you know, they say conference, negotiated, this sort of thing. I do have direct knowledge from people that are part of that process that this is the most controversial aspect of the UAP legislation inside of Congress. Um, it's been clearly conveyed to me that the narrative is true. The government has been giving companies materials related and associated with UAP for 70 plus years. And the idea behind this, the imminent do domain um, provisions they would allow for government like a sense of flexibility to get those materials back if it you know it is helpful for broader scientific analysis that's the way it was described to me so of course there's this pushback like what government can just come and swoop stuff up but if in the spirit of it it's for broader scientific analysis that does make sense rather than having something i don't know locked up in lockheed that they were given a long time ago and at the expense of humanity being able to like broadly study this, um, this provision would help facilitate and adjust that. That That is what's said to me from, from those that are actually making these decisions. But at the same time, it is very controversial and it will need, and admittedly, uh, people are telling me that it, it will require like additional updates and, and massaging, but you know, they're, they're going for the gold. They're going through on a hard punch to pry these programs, these materials, these craft, maybe biologics of non-human intelligence out of the hands of these private industries and say, look, we need a broader scope study of this, which is something Bob Lazar talked about, crime against the scientific community. The fact that this information couldn't be seen by the brightest and the best minds because of the way the classification has been and sadly continues to be in a lot of ways, which we should talk about. So that's what I hear, George. That's kind of the word on, um, you know, the the secret wash. I'm there. I'm there with you as well. I mean, I know it is a controversial part of this legislation. I my personal opinion is it is absolutely necessary to get the job done, because as we've talked before, let's say you're a Lockheed or Northrop and you've got these these things, these machines, this technology. You haven't quite figured it out yet, but you know that if you do, it would be worth billions, hundreds of billions, maybe trillions of dollars could change the energy economy, transportation economy. That technology, if you ever figure it out, could change the world and could be worth untold uh, dollars, uh, just as a pure dollars and cents matter. You're not gonna give that up. They're not gonna give that stuff up. It'll never happen. The only way to get it is to force them to release it, to have a carrot and a stick, as we've talked about before. So I know eminent domain will be controversial. It's a, it's a tough uh, hill to get over. But it's absolutely necessary to get this stuff out in the open because they will never give it up voluntarily. Never. Yeah, I, I appreciate the way you just you know kind of framed that because I, I didn't expect that answer from you. I've heard it a few times now that it's sinking in. I think you're right. I think it is necessary. And look, even within that legislation, you also do have you know the carrot, as you say, carrot and stick. Like if you say this is what we're working on, this NHI, non-human intelligence technology then, you know, we're not going to turn off your funding if, if you're getting it from us. You know, that. so I, I do think there's a lot to, to go with here, but it's got to pass in the first place. It's got to start being law and legislation. With that said, I did want to bring something up with you, which is what I'm hearing and another thing that's just, you know, kind of all over social media, and, and people are right. Then I'm hearing this within government, but also people on social media picking it up, which is that one of the biggest hindrances we're having here towards transparency is actually the, the new UAP classification guideline system. And that's surprising to me because we know some of the authors of that and some of the authors, I was under the impression that there was this real sense that you want transparency. And I, I did some digging and I found out that actually, no, this is a legacy set by people we know 
which uh, makes it harder to get videos out to the public. And I want to hit that right on the head because it really surprised me. Um, so what do you think about that? That's being talked about right now, which is that this new UFO classification guideline system is really making it harder to unclassify UFO videos. Uh, I, I have not heard that, but I've been on the road quite a bit, so you'll have to fill me in on the details uh, of what the classification says and exactly why it makes it harder. I am not surprised in the least, uh, though, because we know that people are putting roadblocks in the way of transparency every chance they get. So this is not surprising, but it's got to be a way to, it can be fixed. So have you talked to individuals who have tried to come forward with something through the process and have been blocked? Uh, no, I have talked with individuals who are looking at the, the big picture of how we can uh, minimize the classification of things to get videos out. And sadly, it's not available for us to read, you know, the public, George, it's in classified documents that says this is how this is what's appropriate or not appropriate to bring forward. So I have heard people that have read it and been like, we're unable to, to do what we could have done the years prior. Now, I, I do. If I really think about it generously, here's what I think why that that happened um you know the, I, I know that some people say there's a need for greater transparency people you and i know people that helped author that stuff maybe there's there's a greater need for transparency on the general phenomenon within government and that they they saw that as a danger the uap issue as a danger toward you know for a strategic surprise within government and that they've never really been advocates for a greater public disclosure at that time or now so I rationalize it like that. There was this real push within government to get people talking. That's why products were made like your friend Jay Stratton made that great product. It was shared within the intelligence communities to educate people. So I kind of think maybe I misunderstood. This is maybe not about public transparency, but it is about the good move of integrating our armed services to knowledge of the UAP phenomenon. Does that gel with what you think it might have been? Yes. I, I'll just, without naming names, I can tell you that people that you and I know and have conferred with for a long time, who are definitely on the inside of this, who've been approached about possibly appearing before Congress, either in an open hearing or even behind closed doors, have said no. And the reason, as explained to me, is telling Congress is the same as telling Red China, is that if you spill it to Congress, it gets out eventually and you're telling the Chinese where we are on this technology, what we know about these phenomena. That's as simple as it, as it gets. That's real. Yeah, and I, I think in that sense, I really do understand, or I'm coming to a new understanding of what transparency means compared to being prepared as a nation for the UAP reality. Well, listen, man, I, I, I want to thank you so much. That was, again, a, a really fun episode. Um, we kind of focused at the beginning of... Uh, you know, alien invasions and war of the worlds. And, and I don't really know what the, the big picture is here, but I know that we are not going to progress with our understanding unless consensus reality matches up with actual reality when it comes to the mystery of UAP. So let's keep cracking at it, George, and I'll see you on the next Weaponized, man. I got to tell you, I, I've been reading uh, on X, formerly Twitter and Facebook and other social media platforms over the past week since your... Um, very vocal plea for action on the part of the public and our listeners and, and viewers. Boy, people responded. Uh, seeing all the responses, they're, they're posting the letters they got from their members of Congress. Some of them are really encouraging answers, too, that the members of Congress put some thought into it. Others just sort of get blown off. But the, the public has reacted. The UFO public is up in arms and it's taken action. And, man, I'm so encouraged. I hope they stick with it. That's so cool. And just a shout out at the end here. So people remember, we still got a week where we need to fight for this. You go to UAPcaucus.com. You go to WitnessCitizen.com. You go to DisclosureDiaries.com. And you go to DeclassifyUAP.org. And everybody can make their voice heard this week. So thanks for saying that, George. And I'll see you next time, man. Never have so few had so much to tell, but could say so little. Following this little weaponized, the presentation of Jeremy Corbell, George Knapp, Dark Horse Entertainment, and Cadence 13 Studios. Available now for free on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your shows.